Hey guys, Jonathan here at Shadow Foam, and this week we have got some very important information for you, and that is all of my top tips in one boiled down video. So if you've been watching the channel for any length of time, you might recognize this. <laughs> Jonathan's top tips. So as I'm cutting foam, I'm always trying to share hints and tips to make life easier, to make it quicker, more efficient, get the best out of this, which is shadow foam material. So this is all of my top tips, plus a few bonus extras that I don't think I've mentioned before, all in one place. So it's a nice, easy reference. Before you start your next shadow foam project, you can come back to this video, give yourself a refresher and make sure you have the best time and get the best result cutting out your shadow foam project. So we're going to break it down into three sections to keep it nice and simple so you can skip forward to the point that's helpful for you. We're going to be starting with cutting, then peeling, then layout. So let's start with the cutting. So first things first, when it comes to cutting shadow foam, make sure you use a really sharp knife. Now we include scalpels with all of our cutting kits and we sell scalpel blades separately. So we have boxes of 100 and we have boxes of 25. So you can get 25 for seven quid. And the idea of that is to keep it cheap for you guys to switch out the blades as often as you can. The blades don't tend to blunt very often when you're just cutting the foam. It's, the thing that blunts them is when you're cutting around metal objects, usually it's the metal object itself that dulls the blade and you'll start feeling it tearing rather than cutting. So as soon as you start feeling the blade tearing, make sure you change it to a new one. Don't try cutting the foam with a kitchen knife like Jim Overton, Jimson's stuff, because you won't get as good a result. <laughs> I think some of the examples we see look like they've been cut with a spoon. Why a spoon, cousin? Make sure you've always got a sharp blade. So if you're using a scalpel, which I would recommend, using a scalpel is the best tool to cut shadow foam, and obviously you want a sharp blade on there. So I'm gonna show you how to fit a new blade. This is something we get asked quite a lot. We do have a dedicated video on this, which we'll link below. Now in all of our cutting kits, the basic and the pro, we include a pair of forceps. Now there's two reasons for this. If, you, if you're new to it, you might be wondering, why do we include forceps? Well, forceps are what surgeons and doctors and scalpel manufacturers recommend for installing scalpel blades. Now, let me put my anti-cut glove on. That's the first thing. We have the anti-cut gloves in all of our cutting kits also to avoid minor cuts and hand injuries. Right, so first thing is open the scalpel blade and resist the urge to just whip, that bla whip the blade out of the packet. What you wanna do is you wanna leave it in the packet and you're kind of peeling it back like this and then you can just pinch the sharp point of the blade within the packet. And that's what you should end up with. That's kind of like the goal here. And then what you're looking to do is just grab the blade at the back, behind the blade, just at the top like that. And then once you've got them with the forceps, the forceps should just clamp like that. And then you pull it out. And then because of the barb on the back of the forceps, it'll just be held in place. Now, if you rotate it round, first thing is you want to make sure you've got the orientation correct. So you should have the number 11 facing you and you should have that angle should be matched up. You can see there, we've got the two diagonals that match up. And then you just want to line up the narrow part of the slot with the top of the scalpel and then put your finger on the back of the forcep here and then you just push down and it should just have a nice positive snap into place and then you can just literally press on the forceps twist them away and that's on and you've not had to put your fingers anywhere near the sharp blade and there we go that is the blade set up to start cutting last reminder always wear the anti-cut gloves i tend to wear one glove on my left hand all of our cutting kits come with a pair, left hand and right handed, but I recommend at a very minimum, the hand that is holding the object, you need a glove on. Typically, I don't wear a glove on the hand that's holding the scalpel because it gives me a little bit more movement in my hand and I can work a little bit faster and a little bit better, but the hand that's holding the items has to have a glove on it because it's so easy to cut yourself. It's so quick with a scalpel. The scalpel is very sharp. Quite an easy way to cut yourself is to kind of leave a scalpel within the middle of a work area, put something on top of it, and then it can fall onto the floor. So make sure you've always got it somewhere in your eye line, you know where it is and keep tabs on it at all time. The blade is super sharp. And that is the most important tip in this whole video is cut safely <laughs> with a glove. Right now, little show secret. You may notice in the videos, we don't tend to change blades. We just kind of crack on through the cutting without showing that. But that's just to make it easier in the edit and without wasting time. But, to do this panel behind me, that took four blades. So if you're careful with the blade, you're careful where you put it, and you try not to run it up against the edge of metal objects, you should get a lot of cutting out of one blade. But there is a tip there. So if you're cutting around delicate items, so, you know, hand tools aren't typically delicate enough to uh, take this consideration, but let's imagine you're cutting around a camera or a lens, or you're cutting around maybe some collectibles. We've done a really cool Zippo case, which we're going to be coming back to later for another tip. But with the Zippo case, all of the Zippos had a really nice painted finish, which we didn't want to damage. So in order to cut around them, we put some 
masking tape just around the top of the scalpel. That means we can run it right up close to capture the silhouette without scratching or marking the side of the item. Now, while I'm on the subject of the Zippo case, on that case, we cut in a hundred of the exact same object. Now to do that and lay them all out and try and get a perfect layout would have been really, really difficult. And every single one was the exact same size. So we used paper templating. Now I'm no IT genius. I'm not very good with a lot of the complicated Photoshop and Adobe Illustrator and all the other different programs that are out there, but I'm pretty good with Word. You know, any sort of Word or pages, you can go in there and create a rectangle of the exact width and height, and then you can use that as a paper template for very simple objects. For more complex objects, you can use the same technique, but you'd have to take a bit more time to capture the silhouette. So with the sneak energy drink wall, we had a square, which was the powder tub, and then the shaker itself was a bit more of an unusual object. Now, we had to do a bit of searching online, but we did find a profile of a tumbler that was the same size as our shaker and we could use that then as a template to make sure that we cut the exact same shape each time and it also made it a lot easier to line up because we could print out multiple so bring up the sneak energy wall here now that was all cut by hand it's all perfectly spaced all the way across and we wouldn't have been able to do that if we used the traditional technique of cutting around the silhouette by holding the item so paper templating is a good tip for multiple items so they're my top cutting tips let's look at peeling So I've got four objects here and I've already cut around them all. And that's just to speed up this video for you. We want to make this all of the killer and none of the filler basically. So that's the torpedo level. I've already cut all the way around it. When it comes to cutting, you've got to make sure you've cut down to the right depth. So I've already gone around it. Now, what is the right depth? Well, this is a 50 mil sheet of foam. This is about an 18 mil deep item. So we want to make sure we've cut down past 18 mil because as long as you don't cut all the way through, you won't weaken the foam. I've cut down here to about 35 mil. And how have I known that? Well, I know that about middle of that ridge is 35 mil. Now, if you want to make it easier or you're a little bit unsure, you can measure the scalpel and you can put a little bit of tape or just put a little scalpel mark. So there's 35 mil, little black line there. Really simple, little mark there can help make sure you've cut all the way to where you need to. And you wanna make sure you've gone all the way around and you've met up on the corners. The corners are the most important part. They're the most likely to tear out and look scruffy. So you wanna make sure your cut is all the way around to the right depth and then you're gonna get a better peel. Now, once you've done that, to peel, you wanna take your strongest finger. Now, we do have some of our viewers and some of our customers that struggle with this, so we've got a couple of techniques to show you here, but we'll start with the classic, the one that I'm doing. So you take your strongest finger, your index finger, I use, but you know, use whichever one you prefer, and you're starting on an end. So, with a torpedo level like this, don't try and start in the middle, start on an end, and you're literally just digging your finger down that cut there. You're just trying to wiggle it down the gap. And what you'll notice is you can feel like the ridges of the layers. And you kind of just want to push your finger in the gap you know, either below a ridge or above a ridge. And that way you can get a bit of purchase on the foam. And then you're kind of pushing and squeezing the layers apart with your finger. So we do get customers that kind of let us know they were trying to peel it like a banana. I say that all the time, we should get it on a t-shirt. So it does not peel like a banana. If I just grabbed it here and pulled it, it would peel a little bit, but then it would kind of go uphill. But we want it to peel out flush all the way across. So you force your finger in the gap and you're literally easing it away. And then once we've got a bit of room, I can get another finger under there and you just kind of easing it away. Now, another question we get asked is, well, does it peel on the layers or mine doesn't peel on the layers and shadow foam doesn't peel on the layers. What you actually find is the layers are the strongest part because the layers are hot laminated together. So typically shadow foam will peel between the layers. So it, there's infinite depth potential. It will peel as deep or as shallow as you need it to. So you just follow it along, peeling, 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 chasing it all the way until there you go. We've come out the other side and I've got about 10, it's not perfectly smooth, but we've got 10 mil of foam that's come away. Now with this, we wanna go a bit deeper than that because I want this flush in. So same technique, I'll put that there. I'm gonna go back, push my finger down a bit further and find the next kind of natural area I can get a bit of purchase on. So I'm pushing my finger underneath and then I can get two underneath and I'm just doing the same thing. I'm just following it along. We call it plowing. So you're plowing the material out. You're kind of trying to split the layers with your fingers, plowing along nice and steady. And if you've cut all the way around to the correct depth, when you get to the end, it should just pull away nice and square. Here we go. There we go. So that is the, the right amount of depth. And it doesn't have to be absolutely perfect. You can see we're pretty close. That, that level there is now sat just below the surface, but it's perfect. It's fine. I'm happy with that. So that's the traditional technique. You've not got the strength in your fingers and we do see that and we do understand that. I'll show you another technique. So I've cut all the way around this pair of Cobra grips. 
Now at this point, obviously I could go in with my finger and peel it back the same method, but another method is use pliers. So you use pliers much in the same way as you do your finger. You wanna press down on the material to expose the side and you can see there, I'm just pressing down right in the middle and you can see all the cuts exposing the side and you just wanna dig the long nose plier in. So about the same level I was pulling with my finger, so about a centimeter and then just clamp the foam and then you just literally like folding it back. And then once it's folded back a little bit, you wanna go back and just tease the foam basically all the way along it's a bit tricky. As soon as you've got a bit of meat, like you can see here, you wanna lose the long nose pliers. They are great to get you started, but you wanna use something more like a bull nose plier like this, or these grips would be fine, because you wanna get a bit more purchase on the foam. You wanna get a bit more of the foam material in the jaw so it doesn't tear. And then you're just chasing it along. But the difference is, you don't wanna just be grabbing it and pulling it away. You wanna stop, hold, and grab the next bit, and just keep pulling it back like that. It's a bit slower, and it's not the technique I shoot for straight away, but it can make it that little bit easier if you're struggling with the dexterity in your hands. You know, these pliers are great because they've got like a bit of a springiness in them. You can see they've got this little thing here. So if you've got some of those, that's, that's quite useful. And you can see here, all I'm doing is I'm holding the foam out of the way, and I'm just grabbing a little bit right at the base, pulling it up, doing the other side, pulling it up, not rushing, and making sure I'm getting that material out. And you can see the finish is just as good. Let me pull this level out. The finish is the exact same quality as we've got on this side. A touch slower, but more methodical in some ways. And there we go. So slightly different approach, same result. We've got this piece that's been pulled out. We've got about eight mils worth of material there. Let's try the pliers in. There we go, that's great. And if you've got a smaller item or you're struggling to get your finger, like sometimes, I'll cut in some really narrow items. You know, in a project the other day, I cut a ruler into a piece of foam and it's a really small piece of foam. You can use the forceps. These are obviously included in all of our cutting kits. So you're gu guaranteed to have a pair and these work perfect for just peeling out small bits of foam. If, you, if you're really trying to get down a small little gap, you can just use these and pull the foam up. So they're also a great little hack for peeling out really small bits of foam really small areas of foam. So another little top tip, use the forceps, not just for the blades, also for like tricky little items when you're trying to peel it out. So that's peeling with pliers, but obviously we've done the knife here. The traditional way of just pushing your finger down and peeling it back towards you is great. And you can see what I'm doing here with this knife is, I'm digging my finger down a little bit deeper and peeling out two layers. So I'm peeling out 20 mil in one go. And that's traditionally when I'm doing these liners at high speed, as you've seen in the time lapses, if I'm peeling out 40 mils worth of foam, I'll usually peel it out in one pass. You can just dig your finger down as deep as it'll go. You can almost count the layers on your way down and then you can peel out four layers at once. So here we've got a knife. I want it to go about 20 mil into the foam. I'm pushing my finger past first two layers. I'm getting down there and then I'm peeling it back the exact same method. And there you go, in one pass, we've got 20 mil that's ripped out, nice and smooth, and that just speeds up the process. So that makes it a lot quicker and easier too. Now, finally, big item like this is 50 mil and the foam's nearly 50 mil. So we've got a slightly different technique for this. Now, this can also help if you're really struggling with peeling and you're looking for a bit of a hack to remove peeling entirely. This one is cutting all the way through the foam. So it's the exact same technique. You cut around the item, but then you just keep cutting, you keep cutting. Make sure you've got a cutting mat. We sell these on the website, but you can get them from Amazon. They're available in all different sizes and colors. I like a nice big cutting mat on our work surface so I can kind of shift around and it doesn't mark the surface. But you wanna make sure you've got a cutting mat and then you're cutting all the way through the foam, right to the bottom. There we go, so I've cut all the way through. I should be able to put my hand underneath now and just push that out. There we go. And for a deep item like this, you could leave it there. Depending if you're happy with that finish, maybe this is going in a drawer and you've got a foam layer in there already. You could call it a day there and that saved all the peeling. For that item, I didn't have to do any peeling. So that might be a useful tip on its own, but let me show you what I do to make this finish match everything else. So. The item is in there, but we can put some foam in the bottom, but not very much, maybe five mil. So what I do in this instance, I take my piece of material that I've just cut out, put it on my worktop, and if I want five mils worth of foam, I need a five mil spacer. So let me find something. Four or five mil, something like that, right? So what I've got here is one of our stencil packs. Now, obviously, usually we talk about using these for uh, radiuses on the corner of inserts or cutting finger pulls, but here's another little use for it. So you can lay them on a flat surface, all three, Put the scalpel on top like this, and then we can use that now, as long as you're putting pressure here and holding it in place, you can now use that to try and to slit, basically, the base off this. And you just go nice all the way around, nice and simple. Take your time and just slowly work in. And I can push the blade out now, I can see we're getting close. And there we go, we've slit now five mil of shadow foam, which is the perfect shape that we need, off the back like that. And we can put that in the bottom, and you wouldn't know that you've not peeled it. 
And if you're putting that in a drawer, it's perfectly fine. You don't need to do anything else. You've got the red color there, you've got the contrast. And let's imagine that this is a much shallower item, this knife for instance, and we cut all the way through. Well, what do we do? Well, we just take something that's a bit taller. Let's take this scalpel box and let's do the same technique but on that different height. And this can just help if, you, if you're really struggling with the peeling or you've got some really tricky items and you're uh, like sometimes if you've got a really large power tool and you've got too much foam to peel and you're feeling like it's too difficult well just cut all the way through and then just try this technique because you can put the foam cut off back in it's really quick and simple it's using no additional tools no you don't need to get anything else you're just using what you've got and you can see there we've got a perfectly flat bottom it's now only 15 mil insert but you can see that that's a technique that can be used for power tools it can be used for small hand tools it can be used for really shallow items if you're just struggling with peeling or maybe you're just a perfectionist and you look at that and you think that is far more smooth because that's almost machine cut and that's the beauty of scalpel blades they are super super sharp and they lay super super flat so i see sometimes people cutting inserts with all manner of knives but a scalpel is the ultimate because it's so thin you can get really close to the items it's got such a thin side profile and you can also do this technique with it which we do do in our videos we don't talk about it often enough and i hope you're enjoying these hints and tips and if you want to see more or you've got some of your own hints and tips let me know in the comments because i read all the comments and i reply to them all and this is all about sharing so if you've got any tips that i've missed let me know because i'm always keen to hear more so that's all of the peeling let me show you something about smoothing Right, so when it comes to smoothing, we have done a really good video on that. So go and check the link in the description or go and click up here and we'll send you off to a video all about smoothing your bottom. Not waxing it. This is about using some of our various kits. So foam finisher, hot foam smoother, smoothing spinners, all of these things are available to help you get the smoothest finish on your shadow foam. But one top tip that we didn't share in that video, which I think was an oversight because I do do it all of the time, is when you're smoothing out an insert, sometimes this smoothing spinner or Although it's deceptive, it looks 50 mil long, but you lose a lot of that depth in the collar of the impact driver. So I quite regularly use a little extension like this. So it's only simple, they come in all different sizes, I've got all different versions of these, and it just helps you smooth out the bottom of some of those deeper, more awkward items. And I haven't got it here with me, but you can get some flexible versions as well. So if you're struggling with the dexterity, again, you can hold the drill like here and you can have a little flexible extension. So if you want to see that, maybe we could give that a test. Don't actually have one, but we'll put one on the screen. You can see it. They're on Amazon. We'll put links to this stuff in the description. It all works in much the same way. This is a quarter inch fitment. So any quarter inch accessories, all the different length extenders, you don't need anything special. You can get the cheapest one on Amazon and it's going to do you just fine because you're not putting it through its paces, drilling screws or drilling walls or anything. You're just using it for a foam smoothing spinner so get on amazon and choose the best one for you but that is a really handy tip to have in your shadow foam cutting toolkit have a bit extender so that's all i'm going to tell you about smoothing if you want to know more go and watch the smoothing video but next let's have a look at layout so when it comes to layouts this can be the trickiest part for me sometimes i can spend more time doing the layout than i can doing the cutting and i've been doing shadow foam for 12 years now, cutting videos on YouTube for seven years. So once I've got a layout, I can just plod through it and I quite enjoy it, it's quite cathartic. But the layouts can sometimes be a bit of a brain teaser because you want it to look perfect. You want everything puzzled in, you want everything grouped together. But I've got a few tips for you to help you get started. Now, when I'm doing items, I've got all the items I was using a minute ago, plus I've grabbed a set of spanners and if I need anything else, I can grab it out of the wall behind me. If you've not seen that, go and check out the Milwaukee hand tool panel build or go and check out some of our other videos because every video I'm cutting foam and there's always a layout segment where I'm using the same tips that I'm going to show you now. So typically I'll start with big items and I'll start at the corners or the edges because I'm looking for like right angles here straight away. I look at the item and I look at that right angle there and I think, well, that lines up lovely. And where I'm going quite close to the edge of the foam, it may change, but I'll start with about a 20 mil gap, something like that. Now, as I start piecing it all together, that may creep away from the edge or it may creep closer, but we're using that corner really nicely. Now I can see we've got a gap up here. So I want to put a piece in there to take up that little gap. So maybe that knife, but we'll come back to it. The next part I look at is something like the spanners because we want them all together and we want them all in order. So these aren't going to just go randomly placed. We need to get them all into the layout. Now, depending on the amount of items you're trying to fit in your liner, you may want to put these on the side. There's always a temptation and I, I'm always tempted to lie them down. I feel like they look better. You can see the numbers and there are a few different ways you can offset them. Sometimes I'll put them staggered like this because they take up less room. You can get them closer. Sometimes I'll top and tail them. 
but essentially, if I can, I lie them down. But if you're trying to squeeze a lot of tools in a small space, you can get a lot more in, and this is one of the big advantages of shadow foam. If I lay them out like that, we're taking up 22 centimeters of the foam, 22 centimeters across. Obviously, we've got a little bit of room here, but 22 centimeters. If I stand them all up, I can have a similar gap between them, about a centimeter gap. It's tricky because when you're doing a layout, obviously you can't leave them standing up. So you almost have to just cut these in and then carry on with the rest of your layout. That's typically how I do it. But with about there is where we'd get to. And that is just under 11. So we're less than half the amount of space. So that's what we'll do for this insert. I'm gonna cut these in to show you. So we're gonna cut those in on the side. We're gonna go for that there. Then we've got pliers. And the way these, you can see a sprung, but I'll always cut these in held tightly like this. Now, in the comments, you might tell me that's not a great idea because you're gonna lose a little bit of the springiness, but this is the only set of pliers that have this spring in them I've ever had. And I've had these probably about, I'd put these at about 16 years old. These are from my apprenticeship. I worked with a guy called Alan, absolutely great engineer. And he always taught me the value of good tools. And Facom were one of the brands that the RS components catalog had. So every now and then we'd get a big order in from RS and me and, well, Alan, you'd usually add a good tool on there for me and I had a few Facom items come through and these were one of them and they've still got a spring in them so you know you can complain all you want about if I cut these in but I've never cut them in any other way and these have been in quite a few different builds and panels so I'm going to stick to my guns on that one and I'm going to put these top and tail and they'll take up that room again as soon as I let go it's going to spring out so you almost have to make a mental note of where that's going to and that brings me to the masking tape so when I'm doing a row of items you want them to line up perfectly that's really important especially with spanners it can look really jaunting when things are wonky so quite an easy way of doing that is just taking some masking tape and making some visual references. So for this, I'm gonna want a nice even gap along the bottom so I can put tape in that section or an easier way to do it. You can see that I'm creating a nice little gap here. So I may as well just tape the whole edge. And you'll see in some of the videos when we're doing high speed time lapses, I'll be getting tape out to make sure everything's nicely in line. It's all matching. And another little tip for this is if you wanna make a little visual reference, you can use one of your blades that's maybe gone a bit dull. I'll measure it. And I'll say, right, it's going 15 and I'll just stick it in. Very much like a haberdashery or like someone who's doing sewing, they use little pins, don't they? So you just stick a pin in there and that's at 15 now. You don't have to mark it and stick up to it. And on this side, I could stick another pin in to be fair, but I don't really need to. And there we go, that's 15 mil. Front to back, back to front, 15 mil. Nice and square, nice and easy, and you'll never see that mark, gone. So using the old scalpels like pins is also a top tip. I'm getting this, I told you, there's more top tips coming. These aren't even scripted. A lot of these are just flowing out, you know. <laughs> as soon as you start to be on top tips, all of the top tips are coming out. So I'm loving it. So get some masking tape. This again, really cheap, it's widely available. You've probably got some in your house and it's low enough tack that it's not gonna do any damage. Don't go and get duct tape. Don't go and get floor vinyl tape or even tape. sometimes. It can get a bit too sticky and when you peel it off, it can damage the edge. So a low tack, normal masking tape is perfectly fine. I've always found. And if you do have high tack, here's another tip, free one for you. If you have high tack tape, stick it on your t-shirt like that and it'll just take some of the fibers off with it and it'll turn it into low tack tape. And then that again will not damage your insert. So there we go. Let me line up all the spanners. I'll cut them all in and then we'll get a layout sorted. So I've cut all the items in that I'm happy with. We've got the spanners in there, taking up a lot less room. They're taking up 13 centimeters now. It was 22 before, but in reality, when I cut them in, it'd probably spread a little bit more. So I'm really happy with that. And I can still put a finger pull across to get them out nice and easy. I've got the plier set cut in and the torpedo level. And that's typically, if I can't nail down the complete layout in one go, I'll nail down some of the elements that utilize, you know, a good percentage of the area. And now I've got this quite dynamic shape left that I've got this pile of tools left to try and squeeze in. So all I start doing now is looking, we've got a gap up here and I'm trying to find an item that's gonna fill that. So when I'm looking at these items, there's not really much. Because if I put that one in there, I'd have to have it on a bit of a jaunty angle. Actually, it's not too bad, that one. I also like having the logos facing up, but you've kind of just got to play around with it. So if I put those two like that, I've got a bit of a small gap here. So what fits in that? The stubby's a bit too wide, the knife's a bit too wide. So realistically, the stubby looked quite good there. So I'd need something smaller in that gap. 
Maybe the stubbies together looks quite good. And then I've got to try and figure that out. That can't go there, it's too long, so it'd have to go here. It won't go now because it's too long. So just keep playing around. I think that feels like it should be up here. Kind of, it fills that space, it goes hard up to there. And then we've got an, oh, this is a bit of an awkward shape. And have that maybe nesting up against it. Something like that. Maybe put this in a row so that kind of flows on with them. And you can see that's what we're looking for. So that natural, that steps in and it's kind of taking up the negative space of that ply, which is good. And then the adjustable, it'd be nice to have it lying down, but that's another little way of taking up less space you can if you put things on the side obviously we put the spanners on the side but you can pretty much apply that approach to anything anything that's so this the natural way it falls is like that but it wouldn't matter if it was laid like that it takes up a little bit less room same with the knife we've got a really deep insert here so we can really think uh, a bit laterally with the layout we don't have to just be thinking about it all in 2d shapes but we could stand that one up and then that's in the same row as the spanners get that there feeling like the knife would be better there it kind of flows down a bit and takes up that negative space across the top of the spanners so that's quite cool and what have we got left we've got this left and we've got i want to put this bit set in i think maybe we switch just do a bit of a switch through there because we've got a lot of negative space around these it's by top and tailing these screwdrivers kind of utilizing the space a bit better maybe that can go there feels like it all falling into place now i have to spread it out a little bit but we're not far off there something like that yeah i'm pretty happy with that so there we go oh, no, and then we've got this and a pen now i put these in because this is another part of the layout when you're doing a layout and you've got like a 50 mil or a 70 mil line like we've got here don't forget you've got space under the item so anything that's a large flat item you've got another layer there and as long as it's not an item you want to be visible all the time or it's something so this is perfect because it's an accessory it's not something you're going to be maybe looking for straight away it can be cut basically you've got another area of foam under there and that's another flat area we can lay that there cut around it peel it back and we can have a double depth something like a pen because it's so small it can go pretty much under any item there's loads of room even under there look underneath the ply it would fit underneath there it would fit underneath the adjustable underneath this I think the most logical place is underneath the pry bar, but utilizing the depth is a big tip. When you're doing the layouts, for Colin Furs, we put his heat gun in the wall and we put all the little heat gun adapters behind it because you want them with the heat gun. You're never gonna need them on their own. You're only ever gonna need them when you're using the heat gun. So it makes sense to have them behind, not spoiling the effect, keeping them hidden. Colin loved it. I think that was one of Colin's favorite bits. Yeah, but no, yeah. I'm, really, I'm really pleased with that. Absolutely yeah. brilliant. I'm pretty happy with that layout. When you've got a layout you're happy with, take a photograph. With this one, I could probably remember it, but it's very tricky. After you spent a long time getting a layout, take a photo. It's so much easier to then move everything out of the way. And you can then go piece by piece through the layout without loads of things around. So let me cut all of these in. And then last thing is finger pulls. Right, so there we go. I've cut everything in and I'm really happy with that layout. We've not got much dead space. We've got a nice balance. Everything's got nice gaps between it. You're looking for five millimeters, really minimum gap. Try and go for eight mil. You can see here, I've got eight to 10 mil. It all looks evenly spaced. Uh, one of the main things is where you've got tools quite close to each other on a long run, you want a wider gap. Where you've got kind of corners, kind of getting close to each other. You can see here, we've got like a bit of a corner sweeping in. You can stand to have a smaller gap there, but like I say, we couldn't have that like two mil off, you know, five mil off the edge. It would all be a bit weak. So I've got about 10, I think that's about 15 mil on the edge there. But that's the layout all done. The only thing we're missing now is some finger pulls and accessibility stuff to make it easier. Right now, some of these items are really difficult to get out. So that is the first top tip because you'll thank yourself later for taking the time to do finger pulls now. I think there is a temptation sometimes when you get to this point to say, that's job done, it looks mint, but it is quite difficult to work with if you don't add finger pulls. Some of these items are quite tricky to get out, you know, particularly, you know, when they're really all the way in there, it looks fantastic, but you need finger pulls. So make sure you take the time to do that. And it is really, really simple. And you only need a couple of items. 
So when it comes to finger pulls, you don't need much. The same scalpel we've used all along, and then I always have a standard steel ruler, 25 mil wide. We have them on the website, but you can get them anywhere. One of our stencil sets, which you can't get anywhere, you can only get that from us, because we made this, or I did, and it helps you with radius and corners and circles, and it's a tenor. So one of those is also a great thing to add to your toolkit. Now in there, you've got three templates. One of them is radius guide. Now that's for doing like radius corners on flight case inserts, stuff like that. And then the other two are all circles from 10 mil all the way up to 50 mil in increments of one mil all the way up to 34. And then it goes up to like four mil increments. We just want this one. Now this is the one I always use for individual items. So you can see this knife here, it's not really linked to any of the others. And for a finger pull for that, we're just gonna add a semicircle. So I'm gonna go for a 34 mil circle and I'm just gonna cut a quick 34 mil half moon there like that. Move the stencil out of the way, go back again, cut down to the same depth as this. Now you can just put your finger in there, pull it out, but a really little simple tip is to get the smoothing spinner, push it down to the same as the existing item, and then just spin that up. And that just makes it easy to pull that out at the exact same depth. So that little simple tip you can do with all of the finger pulls, you can do it for the same tram lines as well. So that's one item done. Now I'm gonna show you another tip. So see this item here? You could put a little tram line here between these two items. We're gonna do a tram line down here for the spanners. We'll probably go all the way across for these items. But let's pretend we don't wanna put a tram line for some reason on this. It's an odd shape. It's in the middle of nowhere, let's say. I'm gonna show you another way of improving accessibility without kind of adding a finger pull. Now, some people don't like finger pulls at all, and this can also improve your layout. So this item here, what we're looking to do is create a way of lifting that out really easily. So all we wanna do is take the item out of the way and we're just gonna cut a cavity underneath one end. So just gonna cut around the bottom here. And now you can do this with any deep liner. You can do this with spanners on a 30 mil liner. So this does look really great. If you want all the spanners cutting individually without finger pulls, this works great for a spanner. You just do exactly what I'm doing, but with a spanner. So half of the layout, you just cut down a big square, peel this out, and it's gonna give you like a big notch that's sat underneath the item. Now, when I put the item back in, you can't even tell. It looks the exact same. But if I push down on that end, it pops up. And that's a nice, easy way of adding a finger pull or an accessibility kind of tweak to your layout without affecting the front light look. So you can do that to full sets of spanners. You could do it with a pry bar. We could do it with anything on here. And it's the same technique. So that's the item sorted. Let's do a tram line all the way across the bottom now. And then that'll sort that whole row out. So for the tram line, all you want to do is take all the items out. Let's put them all over here. I'll put, I'll put the spanners up here. And you can see how tricky it is getting these items out without finger pulls. You've really got to kind of work to get them all out. Oh, we haven't cut those in. So for a hidden item, we've just got to a little thing I forgot. So lie it on the foam as if it was a fresh piece of foam. Cut around it, take it out of the way, go back again. Make sure you've cut down to the, to the right depth. This is only literally about eight mil deep, it's a really shallow item. And then we can just go and peel another layer back. And there we go, that's that now cut in there and it's hidden. If we put the torpedo level back in, you wouldn't even know it was there, but it's got a nice little home. So for the tram line, we need a long straight edge. And for that, I use a one meter aluminium ruler. Now these are sold as builder's rulers usually, but we have our own shadow foam version and it's just perfect for this kind of job because it's an aluminium extrusion. It's thicker, it's not wobbly and it's got a handle on it. So you can get your hand out of the way. Now I usually try and use the actual track itself as a way of squaring up because it doesn't really matter where this goes. We could have our tram line in the middle, anywhere pretty much. It could be in the middle of the items, lower down. I usually go for somewhere that just looks nice and kind of feels right. So here, we've kind of got a circle coming around here, which would look quite nice. But if I cut there, you might still struggle to get your finger down the side of the uh, torpedo. So that might not help. So it might be better to go in the middle here. Probably about there would be good. We don't get too close to the top of these. So once I've got that position, I can set my straight edge, make sure it's um, square, 12 mil off the bottom there, 12 mil off the bottom there. Once I'm happy, I just use my, my track is gonna be the ruler's width. So from this point on, there's no measuring required. All I have to do is hold this in position, put all the way across. Simple as that. Now don't move the ruler and go again. Then you get a nice perfect cut. Now don't move the ruler still. Now you put the straight edge and match it up to the ruler. So you can see it pushes up nice and square and we just cut again. That gives us a perfect 25 mil tram line and really, really easy. Nice and square. And just as a, another little uh, idea, sometimes I'll put track lines on an angle. Sometimes that can just make it easy. You don't have to line it up with anything. You're just going same ruler, just maybe it's going an angle across the spanners and then you just cut across both sides. But for this one, we've gone square all the way across. 
Now we've cut down both sides, we want to go back and cut down to the depth of the items. And you want to go nice and steady and do this on every single one. And then when you get to an area where we've got multiple in a row, you can kind of just pull the scalpel across. So here, start getting a bit faster with it because they're all the same depth pretty much. And again for this, let's go back with a spinner. There we go, so that is that tram line done. So we've got a couple of items left. That one's got a finger pull. These two need a finger pull. So again, I'm just looking for the natural place to put half moon. So we'll go back to our little 34 mil stencil here. And I usually will do all of the finger pulls if I'm doing semicircles the same size so they all match. I'm gonna go back, put half moon here. You really can just whip around. This never takes more than a couple of minutes just to go, go around and add all the finger pulls. And it's absolutely worth doing. It makes life so much easier later down the road when you're actually using this on a daily basis. Here you go, we've got another little challenge here now. So this stubby screwdriver, well, there's kind of a natural spot there, look. We can see, we can just get a nice half moon 34 mil there. That's not encroaching on any of the other tools. So that's another one solved. And we just work it item by item. I can't get the spinner in there, so I'll just peel that out. And there we go. That is the layout, 100% complete with all of the finger pulls, all the accessibility. We've got tram lines, you've got the half moons, and then we've got the nifty little pop-up. So what was your favorite? Which finger pulls would you go for in your build? Or would you mix all three up? Or maybe you don't like finger pulls at all. Let me know in the comments. Hopefully you've enjoyed all of these tips. Now I'm sure there's other things, there's other tricks and tips out there which I don't know about and I want to hear them. So let me know in the comments if you have been cutting shadow foam and you found some other little nifty hacks that will make life easier. Please help us out and click that subscribe button. We're so close to 100K subscribers on this channel so it's an exciting time for us. So it helps if you click subscribe, like the video and drop us a comment if you're going to use any of these tips with your next shadow foam build or if you've got some tips of your own that you share with me i'd love to hear them so thanks very much and we'll see you in the next one thanks for watching if you like that video why not check out some of our others we've got new videos coming out every week and colin furs what's the quickest way for people to see these videos subscribe